yesterday or thereabout, uh, Matt Galleon on his blog, mattgallion.blogspot.com, uh, posted an interesting article, article, and I'll link it down below. But he's talking about um, narrative and philosophy and what's the use of it. And he, he's talking about um, Zizek, and he raises this quote, um, and Zizek says in this quote, my friend told me that, that Noam Chomsky said that something very sad. He said that today we don't need theory. All we need to do is to tell people empirically what is going on. Here, I violently disagree. Facts are facts, and they are precious, but they can work in this way or that way. Facts alone are not enough. You have to change the ideological background. And, and I couldn't agree more. I mean, I don't know what Chomsky actually said, so that's fairly moot. But at the end of his blog, um, Matt asks this question. So what do you think? Tolkien or Lewis, which is to say, uh, you know, the Lord of the Rings or Narnia. Narnia, which tends to be more um, kind of parable-esque, very more uh, obvious with Aslan being the Christ figure, etc. Um, or, or Tolkien, who really felt like, uh, as Matt says in his post, that the, the message of the Christian message should be buried deep so as to not interfere with reading. Chomsky or Zizek. Narrative philosophy or philosophy of narrative, both or neither. And this is actually something that I thought a lot about and I have a couple of things that I thought would be useful to share. Um, the, the first is um, a book by Amos Wilder called Theopoetic. And right in the very get-go, he, he, he says something which is specifically this point. And so I'll just read. This is literally from page one of this book, 1976, Amos Norton Wilder. He says... Um, it is at the level of the imagination that the fateful issues of our new world must first be mastered. It is here that culture and history are broken, and here that the church becomes polarized. Old words do not reach across new gulfs, and it is only in the vision and oracle that we can chart the unknown. Before the message, there's the vision. Before the sermon, the hymn. Before the prose, the poem. Before any new theologies, however secular and radical, there must be a contemporary theopoetic. The structures of faith and confession have always rested on hierophanies and images, but in each new age and climate, the theopoetic of the church is reshaped. And I'll skip ahead and read his next passage. My plea for the theopoetic means doing more justice to the role of the symbolic and the pre-rational way in which we deal with experience. We should recognize that human nature and human societies are more deeply motivated by images and fabulations than by ideas. This is where the power lies and the future is shaped. And so his idea of the theopoetic is, is not necessarily about theology in verse, but saying, let us really engage with that creative, imaginative part of ourselves. We're not composed of, of facts. Um, you know, Rickhauser says we're not made of atoms, but of stories. And obviously that's in of itself some metaphorical thing, but I think it's actually really true. Um, and the second thing I want to share before some of my own comments is this book by Sandra Schneiders called The Relevatory Text. And she's talking about Paul Ricoeur, um, and she's talking about w what it means to engage in a text. And I want to just share that, um, both Ricoeur and Gadamer agree that understanding in the fullest and most proper sense of the term is as the final objective of interpretation, so reading a text, involves a fusion of horizons. The world horizon of the reader fuses with the horizon of the world projected by the text. The reader enters into and is transformed by the world before the text, even as this world is modified by reader's interpretation. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. In some ways, the two worlds have fused after concerning yourself with the item, and the reader or viewer, in the case of art, now lives in a transformed reality. And so Gadamer and Ricoeur both have this idea that somehow engaging the text is a way of engaging the other, and somehow by entering into it, you, you end up profoundly changed. And I think that this is much more along the ideas of what Zizek is talking about, and I think is incredibly important for us. The idea of engaging the text, treating the text as a different perspective, because when you read, if you take that on, or as Schneider talks about in her book, if you ever go into a theater and you're watching a performance and you forget 
that it's not real for a moment. There's something about your own reality that gets shifted and altered. And that doesn't mean that the play becomes real for you in that moment, but something about who we are and how we are as, as living storytelling narrative creatures um, changes when we engage. And that transformed reality is powerful. And a significant number of folks, including Gadamer and Ricor, uh, Zizek, uh, Wilder, Schneiders, um, you can also talk about Jerome Bruner. There's a whole variety of folks that really say it is stories that compel us. It is narrative that we learn from. And it, it's easier to hold on to information just in a very empiric way when it's part of a narrative as opposed to just facts laid out. So if it is in fact true that Chomsky said that, I, I couldn't disagree with him more. I think stories are at the heart of what makes us um, human. And that gets to a little bit of an essentialism, but they're really important in the very least. So what? <clears throat> Here's the bottom line, and I think this is very concrete. We have often, at least for myself, I've been taught that books are a place you know, where, where information is held. You know, in here, there's lots of things that I can know. And this book, The Relevatory Text by Shan, uh, Sandra Schneiders, certainly is a, a narrative. It's you know, very informational. But what I would encourage folks to think about, both as readers and if there are pastors out there, is that when we read, what we're doing in some way or another, if we're agreeing sentence by sentence and line by line with the thinking of, of the text, then we're somehow getting ourselves into the shoes of someone who's not us. And good writers, especially good narrative writers who are working with story and the power of that, of that arc of the beginning and the middle and the tensions and the conflicts, they're allowing us to experience to some level the experience that someone else has had in the writing. You know, when you write for yourself, even if you're writing fiction, you're somehow telling your own story. You're communicating things the way that you want to. And then when I read that, for a moment, I enter into that world that you've created. And as, as ministers, part of what we can consider is that as that scripture and the stories of our faith traditions, they offer us an opportunity to engage a story that's both ours through the inheritance of the faith tradition, but also something separate. And we begin to ask questions about the parables of Jesus and, and wonder about that. And so the text isn't just a place where we get facts and information and rules to guide our life. The text is a place that we can enter into to experience some, some fragmentary moment of, of what, that, what that world in the text is like. And when we disengage from it, somehow we're different for having envisioned the world that way. So it's not just that we go there and, and kind of salad bar pick out the things that we like, that we want to use as just as a as ammo in some religious war, we actually engage the text and kind of get in there and look around and think about what the world would be if it was the world of the text, whether that text is academic or not. And then when the book is down or the play is over or we're out of the museum, somehow we have seen something before that we didn't know was out there and it changes us because we know there's a new hope. There's a new possibility or another way that things might be. And and so I, I really encourage folks when they're reading to really encourage and poke their head in and look around and for pastors to consider that using scripture that way and to consider the transformative aspects of, of really fully engaging the text. Um, I think there's a lot of power there and there's a lot more creativity and that theopoetic perspective in there than just simply treating the text as a collection of facts and statements.